Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the hacking and uh, uh, tech session. Glad to see you here. Uh, I hope that you had a wonderful morning. And uh, today we're going to continue with uh, a very, a very uh, challenging topic about hacking and different types of techniques that we can use maybe for good or maybe for bad. And the first speaker represents uh, one of the biggest IT companies, Accenture. And uh, she, uh, she has always been a very active participant in all other security conferences. So uh, I invite you to uh, be uh, not to be shy and to ask your questions because this is a great opportunity to listen to an expert. So uh, welcome, Alice, with uh, her presentation on honeypots. Uh, do you think that honeypots has to do something with honey? No. Oh, yes. Okay, sometimes. We'll see. So, uh, let's meet Alice and good luck. Right. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone, and I hope you enjoy this session. Okay. Huh. So, what is a honeypot? Uh, it is a system that is designed to be vulnerable, to attract attackers um, and to uh, kind of study their behavior, uh, how they compromise a system and what happens after they compromise a system in some cases with some honeypots. Uh, how to do this? Uh, in order to achieve that, a honeypot system uh, has to look available, so it has to look easily accessible, has to have weak passwords, maybe no encryption, uh, other kinds of security weaknesses like outdated software against which you can use uh, a known CV or something like that, a lot of services running and exposed. It can't look too hackable though, because that is going to be suspicious and we want, we want to attract people. But the honey part of the honey pot uh, is actually the data that it contains, whether the system looks like it could have something of value, uh, maybe usernames and passwords, maybe some backup data that can be used on a live system to get in, uh, some information on backdoors. Uh, backup systems are actually a very good thing to model um, uh, a honeypot after, as they typically contain a lot of old data that's not in use but could be still there on production systems and could be used against production systems. So that is something attackers are typically after. So you have to put something of value on there to make them want to attack the system. Um, there are different types of honeypots as well. Um, so some of the most basic ones are just sensors um, and they're called low interaction honeypots. It's something like uh, a null listener, so something that exposes a service but doesn't really do much when you try to interact with it. Or, or honey tokens, which don't necessarily even need a honeypot installation or an instance at all. It's just some kind of data that you can trace all across your network. Um, to find out where your weakne weaknesses are and what are the propagation paths across your network and, and attempt to fix them. Um, and also you can find out what the hackers were actually interested in, uh, which I think is the most uh, kind of uh, interesting part, the, the most attractive uh, property of honeypots for us researchers and defenders. Um, there's medium interaction honeypots, which will definitely be some sort of a system, usually a layer put on top um, of a running host that exposes services and may interact with an attacker in some way to make the services look more or less realistic. It's bound to contain some kind of realistic sets of data. So for example, something that looks like backup data, something that looks like user files um, or a web server, for example. And uh, high interaction honeypots, uh, which are typically whole servers that emulate real systems, or even honey nets, which can emulate a network um, that can be attacked uh, by these uh, hackers that we're trying to lure in. There's also a next generation uh, kind of honeypots, uh, which 
may or may not be called adaptive honeypots. Uh, it's not it's not something that's already kind of massively in use. So um, it's going to be a while before they make their way into the official terminology. Um, there are a lot of benefits to having these honeypots. Uh, in, uh, for example, for me, it's mostly for research because I'm really interested in what happens after an attacker gets in. Because getting in is no longer the difficult part, really, because you can basically assume that someone at some point uh, is going to penetrate a system. But what happens after that is the most interesting part because that's where you can mitigate the impact of an attack and actually make sure that even if they get in, they don't get anything out of there. Um, it offers fewer false positives and kind of a deeper understanding uh, of, of um, the security events that take place. And that is uh, a lot on top of what your general intrusion detection systems and firewalls and logging monitoring systems will offer you. Uh, in fact, honeypots can be used to fine-tune these systems, uh, offer extra information about what goes on uh, when a breach occurs. Um, it's also a great opportunity to find new kinds of malware, new kinds of exploits that you haven't seen before. Uh, perhaps even zero days uh, if they're used against your system, which if you're a large business is very likely. Um, and yes, it's it's very good for defenders uh, in that sense because they can analyze what goes on, uh, what type of malware they were hit with, what family it belongs to, maybe even find out who did it using this information. So it's kind of an improvement on top of what existing uh, security monitoring systems already do. And uh, one other benefit uh, is that you can do something called cyber criminal profiling, which comes from your typical normal criminal profiling uh, and is actually quite a high value exercise because it could allow you to um, study the attacker's skills and experience from what they did. You can learn what they were after, what's their motivation. Um, how, how they operate, what kind of means they have access to, maybe even their origins, uh, like which country they're from or whether they belong to an organized uh, cyber attack group or not. Uh, it's all very good information to feed your defense tactics, your incident response, um, and all of these security operations that you're running day to day and increase your chances of actually uh, minimizing impacts of, uh, of an attack and uh, prevent similar attacks from happening in the future. Um, there's a lot of common behaviors that have already been found uh, by various honeypot projects, which are very interesting. Um, for example, common attacker behaviors are check software configurations, uh, install some software, download something from a repository, run something, change the password to ensure that they have access to the system but someone else doesn't, um, check hardware configurations and change any kind of configurations on these systems. Um, one uh, actually new thing that I learned in one of the conferences uh, this year and this month uh, is that apparently in Latvia there are eight honeypot sensors uh, of the new HoneyNet project uh, and they're already picking up some data. They're probably low interaction honeypots, something that just uh, picks up random port scans and, and your various uh, attacks. Um, and it turns out that the most popular uh, malware in Latvia is WannaCry. And imagine how much more we could learn if we could place uh, a high interaction honeypot somewhere in our local area. I think that would be um, a very enticing study for us. Um, and yes, in uh, cyber criminal profiling, there already is some research present and there's these different attacker types defined. Of course, they can be um, augmented and modified based on the information that you actually have. Uh, but I think these are pretty good for a starting point uh, for any kind of data analysis. Uh, if we get this kind of more uh, high quality data from 
any kind of honeypots, I think it would be very interesting to study what attacker types we have here in Latvia and what are the attacker skills and basically how prepared do we have to be in uh, combating um, these uh, malicious uh, attackers um, in, in, in our local networks and what's the danger for our local businesses. And uh, back on topic, honeypots obviously aren't perfect. Uh, there's many downsides to running a honeypot in your system or personally. Uh, one of the biggest ones is uh, the uh, legal liability. So if someone uses your honeypot to attack other systems, it's your fault. So that's pretty bad in terms of uh, in terms of responsibility. There's also a huge data volume of what you need to analyze. So there still has to be someone who deals with all this. There have to be some kind of tools that you deploy to analyze the data that you get from honeypots. Um, there's already a lot of dashboards uh, in place that can help you with that, something like Kibana um, or similar tools. But I've also seen implementations of Markov chains to analyze, uh, for example, uh, honeypot communities that get attack, attacked more often and therefore uh, different attacker types that tend to go for these um, communities. So it's all about uh, visualizing this data in order to get most value out of it. Um, and yes, obviously any honeypot software that you run, uh, the software stack can have its own vulnerabilities. So you have to think about that. Uh, your honeypot has to be hardened against attacks in itself, um, as well as make sure that attackers can get in uh, and kind of that they don't think it's too easy. There's a lot of considerations there and you have to constantly monitor and maintain this honeypot system um, in order to get something out of it. So it's, it's quite a high maintenance endeavor, but it could pay off. Um, some of the design considerations uh, that I think uh, are very important in this case are, yes, that it has to be hardened, uh, that you make sure you know all the attack vectors uh, via your honeypot and try and, and secure them and prevent the honeypot from being completely compromised. Or if you're allowing that, then uh, prevent um, it from infecting other systems or attacking other systems. So you have to limit your traffic in some way, um, have a firewall, but configure it to allow some outgoing traffic, but maybe um, cut off your critical systems. Ideally, don't put the honeypot on the same network as your critical systems. That's basically uh, you're, you're designing for failure if you're doing that. Um, you have to have a good intrusion detection and prevention system so that you're alerted instantly when something's happening. It has to be really credible, that, that system, because attackers, not, not all of them are stupid, um, and the really dangerous ones are really smart. So uh, you kind of have to make sure that they're not alerted that they're on a honeypot, because there's a lot of checks they can already do um, to actually figure that out. Um, yes, monitoring is very important because that's how you get uh, what you deployed the honeypot for. And lots and lots and lots of logging, uh, redundant logging ideally, because an attacker gets on your system, they can do whatever they want. If they find your logs, they'll delete them. So make sure they're also siphoned off somewhere else. Um, there's quite a lot that can alert an attacker potentially to it being a honeypot. These are definitely not all the options, but some of the basics you would need to think about if you're deploying your own honeypot. Um, so yes, a realistic set of services don't have everything open because that would never happen. And uh, that's something that if they see, they probably won't even approach that system unless it's an automated scan attack that just covers a whole range of systems. Um, uh, avoid default service deployments. It has to look like it's been configured, purposely installed, like something has been done with it. Um, it can't be too easy to compromise as well, so don't leave it like with no passwords or an empty password. Um, a good thing was actually uh, allowing all uh, password attempts for non-privileged accounts uh, so that uh, 
attackers think that they are trying passwords, but uh, in reality, the system is just letting them in despite whatever password they enter. That's a good countermeasure for when they change account uh, credentials to prevent you from logging in. Um, and yes, have um, well-tested services because sometimes uh, when the services are emulated and you try to interact with them, uh, a, if it reacts in the wrong way, you're instantly alerted that something is off. It's not the actual service that's being exposed here. Um, also, if the attacker is on your honeypot and they can't download something or can't get any traffic out or in the honeypot, again, this will seem really weird to them. And even if it doesn't, they will just leave the honeypot because what's, what's the point? Um, unless they find some kind of interesting data on it. So it may be the case. You just have to kind of role play a little bit and design your, the backstory of your honeypot really well or, or honey net. Um, and they also may notice your logs siphoning out of your system as well if there's really heavy egress traffic. So you may want to hide it in some other protocols. Um, sort of like when um, attackers do uh, data sensitive data exfiltration when they penetrate a network, um, they have a lot of techniques to do that. You may be able to use some of the same techniques to hide uh, the logs that you're sending off to an external system. Um, obviously, virtualization used to be a problem, but not anymore with, with cloud deployments. It's okay to be in a virtual machine, and a virtual machine can actually be, nowadays, a production system. Um, so that's not that big of a problem anymore, um, which I think, yeah, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it makes our jobs easier when designing honeypots because we don't have to like use cherry jails or something like that to um, hide the fact that we're in a virtual machine. Okay. An important thing to note is where you want to put your honeypot. Uh, this depends largely on what you want to get out of it. So if you put it on the public internet, you're looking at everything. Uh, all the attackers, what they typically do, what's their day-to-day -day activity, how's their port scanning, or kind of your, your typical a anyone outside, including script kiddies, so you get like a massive amount of data. Um, maybe you don't want all of it. If you're an organization, you will typically deploy a honeypot on your internal network to see insider threat, which is a really good thing because if someone's accessing that honeypot, then something's definitely off because no one's meant to even know that system is on there. So either you have an intruder who's been very skillful and is accessing your very internal network, uh, or you have an insider who's uh, up to no good. Um, and then also a good place for a honeypot is your demilitarized zone because then you can look at uh, what you're exposing through your externally accessible services. But typically you want it on a separate subnet separated from all of your uh, critical systems. And a typical deployment, uh, a recommended uh, deployment would look something like this. Um, this is kind of an, a, a sample configuration of a honeypot. If we're not using any of the pre-made ones, I am aware they're there, that there's pre-deployed honeypot systems already out there. Um, but if we're building our own, this is uh, something that I would imagine it could look like. You have your uh, SSH uh, service emulation, you have your web app, um, you have things to monitor this web app. You have some kind of basic hardening, which in, in my case is a, just a firewall and an intrusion detection system. You have your monitoring and logging, and uh, you try to evade detection by, for example, uh, in this case, changing the MAC address, which is actually not necessary. So the first thing is uh, Kippo is an SSH honeypot. Uh, you have to redirect your actual port 22 to something else. And then you can expose port 22 as, as a honeypot service. Uh, and whenever attackers interact with it, they pretty much give you all the passwords that they're trying. So you can gather up uh, a good portion of uh, the attackers' popular dictionaries that they use in, in their attacks. 
um, and just see how popular your SSH service is, how often someone someone pokes at it, and whether it makes sense to protect it, and usually it does. Uh, but it's interesting to find out what they use to, to log in and how they try to bypass any kind of um, SSH protections. Um, and you can see here in the screenshots that our port 22 is uh, listening uh, with this Python service, which is uh, a Kipo script to do SSH responses. And it's actually, it looks quite nice. Um, I've deployed a custom web app on my honeypot. Um, just basically to lure in more attackers to make it seem more interesting uh, as a system and to maybe uh, atone for the fact that it doesn't have very many user files because it's okay not to have them on a, on a web application server. Uh, again, it's something that you can use to gather login credentials, maybe even credentials from compromised accounts. Uh, you may be surprised like uh, by the credentials that are used against your web app. You may figure out that, oh, hey, actually, these all of these Gmail accounts seem to have been compromised because they're trying these usernames and passwords of Gmail accounts here. Um, and you actually, it's it's... It's an interesting th thing to, to learn and maybe to alert the community of. Um, it has to have something like an enticing name. Uh, in my case, it's Portal Login and no company logos just to keep the mystery going. Um, I used uh, HD access files to prevent access to my uh, Kippo and ShadowD consoles, which are running on the same server, although typically you would want to deploy them separately. In this case, uh, I didn't have access to a separate server, so I had to kind of deal with running everything on this one server. So in a production system, you'd have your monitoring on a separate system. Um, HoneyD, I think, is a very valuable tool. It was a big pain to configure, but it offers you a huge range of services that it can uh, emulate, and you can write your own scripts uh, in emulating these services as well. So you can uh, write emulation for any service you desire. Uh, it uh, runs the, sp the configured specified ports, uh, as in this configuration file, I've chosen a random 444 port just for um, realistic view of the whole thing. Um, I've chosen uh, Telnet because why not? I mean, you wouldn't typically find it on uh, a, uh, a production system, but sometimes you do, and I'm just really curious to see what people do with Telnet nowadays. Um, and uh, yes, uh, basically it, it's a very, very powerful tool uh, that can also be configured to send logs to an external server. Um, and, and you can really learn a lot about how attackers communicate with different services um, by using HoneyD. But getting it to work is a real pain. You have to break your head for uh, figuring out the networking on it because it basically launches a virtual instance of a honeypot on top of your already potentially virtual machine honeypot, so you need to know what the networking is going to be like. Um, and here you can see it working, so I'm pinging it from an external machine, um, and I'm actually getting responses uh, on my honeypot logs. Um, the uncomplicated firewall, to keep things simple, uh, you can configure profiles, you can allow whole services, uh, basically whatever is topical. So you need to basically allow the ports that you're exposing, otherwise you're not going to get any traffic on them. And you need to try and prevent everything else from, from being exploited in any way. Um, so yeah, some of the basic rules is that I've allowed the ones that I'm using. It's my uh, port 22, my telnet, and my web uh, are my mo most important uh, info gathering services, and everything else is pretty much cut off. Um, Snort is a really good IDS. Basically, it's it's been around for ages. Uh, it's been tested by lots of people, so I trust that it's going to get the job done. Um, again, it allows you to configure rules uh, that will monitor the traffic and uh, even uh, system commands for anything suspicious and either launch an action or prevent these uh, attacks from happening uh, or issue some kind of alerts to your email or 
I think even mobile service. I'm not so sure about that one. Um, but yes, it's it's also a very great tool to use uh, because there's a lot of preset rules that you can use and you can also define your own custom rules. In this case, I haven't uh, defined a lot. I've just set up alerts for the services that I'm exposing. Shadow D is uh, basically a web application firewall, but you can put it in learning mode and other, uh, otherwise configure it to run as a honeypot. Uh, I've set it up to monitor my own uh, deployed web app. Uh, and since it's in PHP, I use the PHP connector. Um, and basically I can look at all of the requests that are, go against my uh, web firewall. And in this lower screenshot, I don't know if you can see, probably not, um, I've highlighted the requests with the passwords with someone trying to authenticate. Um, and there's also a lot of rules on Git that you can download or you can go on and write your own if you're very good with regex, which I hope I hope everyone is by now. Um, syslog, uh, remotely. Uh, this is how we send uh, our logs to a different server. So you need some config on the receiving side and some config on the sending side. It's, it's pretty simple. And then on the receiving side, you can configure further uh, programmatic uh, commands to sort out your traffic based on where it comes from, which application and so on. Um, probably very good for your um, for your logging monitoring system. Um, I've used Mac Changer to change the Mac address. Uh, it has a good list of uh, vendors. The first three uh, Mac address uh, bytes uh, are indicative of a specific vendor, so you need to look those up um, and change that. But it uh, actually, you can even bypass this if you're really uh, laying your trust on HoneyD, because in HoneyD, when you specify your Ethernet address, you can also change uh, the vendor type of your Mac, um, basically. But if someone looks more deeper into the machine and actually fetches the Mac itself, it may be different from what HoneyD is giving you as a result of, for example, a, uh, an Nmap of uh, the system. Um, so yes, this is how I've implemented these kind of practical considerations. I've had to um, skip Sebek because it didn't work with my kernel uh, kernel version and I really, really didn't want to recompile the kernel just for the sake of some kernel command monitoring. So Sebek was, was out. Um, and there are also a, a lot of these pre-made honeypot systems which you can use. So I'm definitely not saying you should go through all of the design and configuration yourself every time you want to deploy a honeypot. If you just want to try it out, there's quick and easy ways you can do it. For example, uh, Deutsche Telekom's teapot offers you free sensors that you can put uh, anywhere you want on your network. Uh, you can either share the data with them or you can opt out of sharing this data with them so it can remain confidential for you. It's a very good system. Uh, for me, it was uh, not configurable enough. It's all containerized. Um, it's kind of, it's very secure, very good, but it didn't offer me enough visibility into what's going on for, for, for to keep me happy, basically. So I've decided to configure my own. Um, there's also Honey Drive that makes uh, a lot of tasks easier for you. It's a Linux distribution, sort of like Kali Linux for pen testing. Honey Drive is a Linux distro for creating honeypots. Um, but again, it has a lot of services, most of them are necessary. Um, and uh, it was a 32-bit system and I needed a 64-bit uh, system to deploy a Shadow Demon. So it was out for me as well and both of these systems are likely to be detected by attackers by skilled and experienced attackers as honeypots so that's another kind of consideration against uh, pre-made honeypots um but oh teapot has this really really nice um web page where you can track all of the data that they've gathered uh, with the uh, open source uh, um, sensors that they have. And a lot of people are actually deploying them. So there's quite a lot of interesting information. There's like real time um, 
attack types uh, going on right here. So there's us as usual this attack map. You've probably seen it in a lot of places on the internet. Uh, but I found it interesting that it's showing you what kind of uh, malware or exploit is used uh, against a specific um, resource. So I think that's kind of interesting. Of course, uh, in my uh, deployment, there's a lot of improvements to be had before it's actually put into production. So a more realistic file structure, maybe, maybe I want to put some user files on there to, or even more web related files, some kind of sysadmin files, uh, remove honeypot related files or hide them really well. Um, uh, I would want to configure encryption for the web application as well. Uh, ideally not with self-signed certificates. Um, so that's kind of an, an expense that needs to be considered uh, same as actual real hosting. Um, I would want to separate my monitoring consoles for Kepo and Shadow D away from uh, from this server, have them on the separate server, uh, probably the same one that's going to receive my syslogs and all the rest of the logs. Um, maybe deploy an application with a vulnerable framework so I can figure out what are the popular attacks against application frameworks and uh, basically what needs to be protected the most. Uh, it can actually save you quite a lot of money if you do this. Um, you figure out what resources in your uh, organization are actually vulnerable and desirable and uh, don't spend money in protecting the wrong places. So um, cover your uh, rear end where it actually needs to be covered. Um, and yes, on, on my deployment, I would definitely improve the IDS and WAF configurations rather than just going with some default basic rules. I would want to configure some um, custom rules to make sure that it's really secure. Uh, and I would want to somehow hide the exfiltration of my logs and all the other data. In conclusion to this, uh, I mentioned the self-adaptive honeypots. Uh, it's honeypots designed to provide some resistance to attackers. And uh, this is where AI comes in again, because you need uh, these machine learning algorithms to teach honeypots what they can and can do uh, in terms of interacting with attackers in a realistic way. Um, and I think it's it's kind of uh, an idea that uh, has a place to be uh, and is going to be more popular maybe in the future, at least I hope, um, because it can really offer you a lot more insight into post-compromise information and into the very internal workings of hackers and attackers um, and allow a better criminal and psychological profile of these, um, of these perpetrators, which is... I know it's mostly interesting for researchers, but I mean, there's some benefits that can be had from this uh, otherwise as well. And I see that I'm running out of time as well. Um, there is more information you can find on adaptive honeypots. Um, there's uh, resources for you building your own um, honeypot. And uh, these wonderful references, and somewhere among these references, there's uh, more info, uh, a paper on self-adoptive honeypots that I really encourage you to look at. And uh, maybe perhaps there is some time for questions. No? Uh, I think we can have one question. Or not. Not as good, too. Any questions? Or are you sure? Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, have you used uh, Apache Web Server or Nginx as well? What? Nginx. Uh, in this oh. case, Apache only. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, yes, a round of applause. Of course, uh, I think uh, you can meet Alice there after the session and ask all the necessary questions, maybe more confidential ones about a specific device. So be welcome to do that and just stay here. I will give you some surprise. Yep. <laughs>